and welcome to the Health Go Live webinar series. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at SureScripts. Just a few housekeeping items to go over. We would like to remind everyone that the Q&A feature will be available, so feel free to send in those questions for the panelists throughout the discussion. Afterwards, stay on to have your mind blown by Silicon Valley's favorite magician, Dan Chan. And with that, I will throw it over to our moderator who joins us from SVB Lyric, Stephanie Davis. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us in our discussion on value-based care and information sharing. We have a quick disclosure slide that's going to go up. That is my fault. I need to have that every time I talk. But uh, for those of you who haven't met before, my name is Stephanie Davis and I covered the digital health space at SVB Lee Rank. I've also now just achieved my life goal of having like a cartoon of me by HLTH. Very happy about that. Um, with me today, we have some of the biggest heavyweights I can imagine from the health tech universe. It's not just in their current roles, but in the fact that these folks have shaped the very digital health space that I look at today. So Tom, Farzad, Karen, there's no way I could do any of your backgrounds any justice. So I was hoping maybe Tom could kick us off with a, a little bit of an introduction on yourself. Sure, sure, happy to. Thanks, Stephanie. My name's Tom Skelton. I'm the CEO of SureScripts. Uh, we are the, the country's leading clinical health information network with broad connectivity to health systems, prescribers, pharmacists, health plans, et cetera. And uh, our job is to help um, enhance the quality of care that patients receive by digitizing transactions that have been historically um, handled um, in, in a non-digital fashion. So very excited to be here. Thank you for coming and being on the program. Um, Farzad, let's have you continue on this. You actually created the entire sector I started covering very many years ago. I wouldn't, well, I, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. But I, I, I was um, at the Office of National Coordinator for Health IT and, and National Coordinator for a period during a key uh, phase where you know we went from 9% of hospitals to 90% of hospitals having electronic health records and was part of the group setting those those standards and um, uh, criteria for those for that digital health infrastructure. But I'm now CEO of Allidaid, which is the other half of, of this program. We are the largest provider of physician enablement tools for um, the uh, providers, physician-led accountable care organizations and other uh, primary care practices taking risk. We're in 35 states. Uh, 800 practices, about $12.5 billion under management. Very nice. And Karen, you also have been very involved, not just in value-based care today as part of Geisinger, but also with a big background in some policy. So tell me more about that. Thanks very much for having me today, Stephanie. So um, I am a registered nurse by training. Um, some time in the public sector, which was a fabulous experience with Farza um, in the federal sector, and then um, in the state sector as Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And now I am the Chief Innovation Officer at Geisinger, which is an integrated delivery network located in Pennsylvania. So you kind of touched everything in the space that we're going to talk <laughs> about today. Good person to have on the panel. So I wanted to kick it off with the idea that the topics of data interoperability and value-based care are something we have talked about probably since Farzad started making everyone get an EHR, <laughs> but um, they're often not viewed as items that kind of are crucial together. So to frame the conversation, I'd love to just sort of hear how you think the two topics really intertwine. I can, I can go, I have a personal anecdote to share. So. Um, I love this. My, my uh, father-in-law is an amazing guy, and he started one of the first staff model HMOs in the country in the 1970s. And I went to him in, when I was starting Allidade, and I said, hey, uh, Dad Berman, I'm going to, we're going to do these things. We're going to um, uh, take risk. Physicians are going to be on the hook for total cost of care. And he just kind of looked at me and, and was was like, how is this different than what we did 50 years ago? So you stole my idea. Right. And, <laughs> and, and then I showed him our, our tech and I could just see the stress go out of him when he was like, 
okay, there is something new here to your ability to really bring data to the point of care and to, and to understand who this person is in a way that we absolutely could not do when healthcare was on paper. So I think that's like part of why we can create these risk models that scale across the country, 35 different states, independent disparate practices, and we can create integration and risk taking together, which is like the highest form of integration, right? Is when you take risk together, but not have it be based on consolidation is through the use of technology. And like EHRs don't do what we need them to do for population health, but without an EHR, it's impossible to do what we wanna do. So it becomes a necessary, uh, if not sufficient predicate uh, to value-based care. Can't manage what you can't measure, right? Have to start somewhere. Now, Tom, you've also had, you have a big background in kind of gathering all the data and making sure it's interoperable. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you see these two connecting? Yeah, Stephanie, I think it's a great question. And I, I think Farzad's story does a, a masterful job uh, of articulating the journey that actually both of these have been on. And there have been fits and starts. If, if you look at it, this journey towards interoperability didn't start because of value-based care. And the value-based care journey didn't start because data was available. There were some needs and these needs just kept compounding. And one thing that I think they both have in common in terms of that journey is, I think everybody thought the growth would be more rapid than it has been and the impacts would be felt sooner. And, and I think that's one of the challenges that they face, but I, I don't think there's any question that value-based care and interoperability go hand in hand. And I, I'd like to think that there was a lot of forethought there. I, I think ONC was focused on laying the foundation with those EHRs and then starting to move the market towards a more interoperable digital platform. And at the same time, CMS was innovating and coming out with new models and Medicare Advantage, et cetera. And I think there you know, is really what is pulling the market forward. And while the pace may not be what everybody wants, I don't think there's any question that they're moving in tandem and they're feeding on one another. And I think that's very positive because value-based care gives everybody in the market that North Star that otherwise we're lacking. And that North Star is, how is the patient? How is the outcome? You know, How do they feel about that outcome? That, that's where we all think we should be. And Karen, you have the, the feet on the street view. And you're also successfully doing a lot of this. So how how do you see them being interrelated? I think they're definitely, to Tom and Farzad's point, I think they're definitely interrelated. I think the difference now, if you look back at Tom's father-in-law, um, I think also we're managing total cost of care. And we, in the past, even though we had some information, it was asymmetrical. So the uh, payer would have a whole host of information on the, but the provider would only have their own information. And I think if we're gonna be successful in managing total cost of care, we have to have all, uh, we have to have all of the data um, on our patients from the payer, the provider data, the clinical data, the financial data. So I think interoperability of all these systems are really the enabler that will allow us to do that. So I think this kind of ties into both of your questions, but you know, the ONC obviously put this together so we can start to gather data. And then we came up with this whole concept called population health. And I just don't use that term anymore. People don't like when I use the word pop health, it's such a bad term in the industry. I would be curious how you guys think value-based care versus pop health differ. Do they at all? If far as that, you wanna take that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think they do. I, I think fundamentally the concept behind both is no one should be left behind. And it's not just looking at the person who's in the clinic today, right? Which is what clinical medicine tends to boil down to is someone sitting in front of me and I, you know, I'm in the emergency room and I'll treat their, you know, their asthma. What's wrong right now? What right, right now? I'm going to alleviate suffering. I'm going to respond to the needs of the person. That's all holy. But the question that population health and value-based care ask is, who's not in the clinic today? 
Who's not from here? Your, who are the 10 people who I should call to bring into the clinic today? What's the denominator? To me, the greatest invention known to humankind is the denominator. <laughs> not just, so don't talk to me about the numerator. What's the denominator? Who's everybody who's, who's in our flock that we need to pay attention to? That is, I think, the, the, the key element of, of both. Do you think the pandemic helped you pull some people from the denominator into the numerator for the first time? Um, I think that the pandemic accelerated trends. Uh, I don't think that, that, that there'll be things that persist after the pandemic that were not um, in motion already, but it greatly accelerated. You know, the journeys that Tom talked about where everything in healthcare seems to take decades, right? As much as we want them to take months, take decades. I think the pandemic accelerated a lot of things. And one of the things that accelerated was this understanding that fee-for-service is not safe. Everyone used to think like, oh, value-based care is the thing that's risky. It's taking risk is risky, <laughs> right? It's right but in the title. Service. It's right in the title. I mean, it's, it's risk on. Versus right, risk exactly. And, and like, docs don't like that term, right? But fee-for-service during the time when we needed healthcare more than ever, practices were going out of business because people weren't coming in the door. And, and it didn't matter how many phone calls you answered, it didn't matter how much population health you did, right? Unless you were in a value-based payment model where you got rewarded for keeping people out of the hospital, you were going broke. And so I do think that we had our, at Allidade, you know, we had our biggest growth year ever in a year where we couldn't visit practices <laughs> to do outreach to them. It was, it was, it was quite remarkable. So you probably have the best perspective as far as out of seeing all of the different providers and how their, their acceptance of value-based care has changed. So what was the biggest surprise? Was it more conversations, deeper conversations? Was it different people coming to the table for the first time? I do think that we, you know, this, the, the classic adoption curve, right? You get the early adopters, then the early majority, the late majority, right? And, and then the laggards. I think we have successfully crossed the chasm between the early adopters and the later adopters. And, and those are the people who, it's not enough for them to say, you know, show me where it's been successful, right? Like when we started the company and we pitched our first group of docs, we were like, just come with us on the journey, right? And there is a very small number of physicians who are just gonna be like, sure, I'll come with you on the journey. I'll trust you, why not? <laughs> Right? Take my life's work. But now we can say like, yeah, over the past, you know, seven years, if you've been with us for three years, you like every single practice who's been with us for three years has, has achieved hundreds of thousands of dollars of additional revenue, right? Like it's a, you pull in a different group, a different segment at this stage of the journey than you did in the beginning. When we were prepping for this, we did talk about how, and Karen, you've mentioned this, there are a lot of folks that just will not adopt value-based care. They've just, they've accepted that fee-for-services work for them. They view this as a once in every hundred year kind of thing. What do you think gets those people, those, those organizations over the line? Farzad, Karen, I leave it to you. Yeah, I, I think those that are really um, holding tight on to fee-for-service uh, um, feel that their life is better in fee-for-service and they're not a change if there's a four event and because they have figured out all of the nuances of fee for service, which is simple. The more you do, the more you get, regardless of how you do it. Um, and I really do believe that they are and, and have talked and interviewed to executives that feel that way. And they simply aren't going to go until they have to. Um, it, they are doing very well. They feel like they're delivering a high level of care. Um, it, they'll tell you it is what it is. Um, I think we re if we want to move as an industry um, and as a country from a policy perspective, um, we're going to have to become aggressive in the stake in the ground to really move to a, a value-based reimbursement system. One of the things I want to highlight in terms of what Karen did in Pennsylvania was highlight the role of the mm -hmm. state in, in competition policy. And that we have, right? I think it was like contra health contracts between payers and providers mm -hmm. have to be approved by the state or can be reviewed by, by mm -hmm. the state regulator. Mm -hmm. And there is a whole bunch of 
um, uh, fundamentally uh, anti-competitive behaviors that can stifle value-based care. So if you have a monopoly in a certain market, you don't need to do value-based care. True. Mm -hmm. Right? And one of the main tools you can use to freeze out competition is not share data. So I'm a big player in the market. I have a chunk of the data that you need to do, and we'll get into the regulatory stuff now, right? To, to deliver value-based care, I wanna call every patient after they go to the emergency room. That's my population health commitment, right? I can't do it if the hospital health system won't share that real-time event notification, right? And so that to me is one of the, the key connections also between value-based care and interoperability where the, there's a role for the state to ensure that we can have competition through data liquidity. Because without data liquidity, you, there are so many ways in which competition can be stifled and value-based care won't matter because I can be big and bad, low quality, and it doesn't matter because I'm the only game in town and the payers have to pay me you know, exorbitant amounts. Karen, I'd love your take on that. How has that evolved? Now that you're in the other side of the, uh, the hospital seat, you hear folks talking about that as something they're still trying to do? I think it's by nature, it's everywhere. Um, I don't think it's, it's as far as that being in 35 states would probably acknowledge that there are those that have the dominance that can, that can continue that type of behavior absent uh, regulatory intervention. So, which is we said, let's review the contracts to be sure that it's a level playing field and, and really let's promote the movement to value-based uh, value-based care by trying to at least mitigate the risk of the behavior that far as I was talking about. And you've and also Stephanie, done a lot I of work. Would, oh, I would just make a, a comment also that this the the proprietary nature of digital assets is something that's been deeply embedded in corporate America. This is not a unique situation with healthcare. Mm -hmm. And what we're transitioning to is a situation where those digital assets themselves have value, but actually what is more valuable is how you can apply them and uniquely add value on top of them to make whatever your business is that much better and to create a new and exciting experience for those that are relying on you. And this is a, a big transition that is going on. And the question is, how do you facilitate that? How do you accelerate that to the pace that folks would like to see it occur? And the bottom line is it's change. It is significant change, it is massive change. And, and you know, th there will be a lot of levers that get pulled here, but the, the journey itself is inevitable. It's just a question of when and how we get there. Tom, you just had to do that with the, the opioid epidemic, right? Well, you know, that, that's another example of where, you know, digitization comes in and, and can have an impact. If, if the majority of prescriptions for opioids are on a piece of paper, that's a much yeah. more difficult thing to track than when we're in a situation where we've got them digitized. And I, I think it is absolutely an important component of trying to resolve what's a tragic situation for the country. Um, I don't think it's the only thing that can solve it, but I think it helps lay some fabulous foundation and potentially yield some insights that we didn't have. Agreed. Did you, because you are kind of sitting in the middle, right? You have all this data that you're connecting providers, payers, pharmacy, you name it. Have you thought of monetizing the data or do you view this more as like a public asset that is very important for the, uh, the rest of the system to have? Yeah, listen, we're, we're a commercial entity. We're, we're, you know, we, we're here to run a business. There's no question about that. We're also very purpose driven. And if you take a look at our purpose, it, it's something that is important to us and it guides us as an organization. You know, we are not out there uh, packaging information and selling it back to large corporations for, you know, purposes that are hard for us to, to capture. Our job here is to help the prescriber, to help the physician deliver the information that they need in partnership with them to take better care of their patients. That's the way we approach this. So kind of bring that intelligence to the point of care. 
That's it. I would be curious from the other sides of the room, how you guys have looked at aggregating data or if it's something that you've internally generated. <clears throat> is, is that, would you like me to take a crack at that? Yeah, let's take, take it away. Yeah. Let's one of the jump things in whenever you want. Yeah. One of the things has been interesting um, is uh, com combining the different data. And in particular, thinking about three kinds of data. Uh, one is uh, the EHR data, and in particular from primary care practices, that tends to be the deepest uh, um, data that we can have because the primary care has a longitudinal view of the patient. They bring in uh, across all the, the different patients, different complaints. So that data is deep, but primary care is 5% of healthcare expenses. And you know maybe 80% of the encounters that happen with the patient are not primary in the primary care EHR. So the claims data provides that broad view of every claim paid on the patient by the payer, gives you a broad view of all the different experiences that the patient is having with the healthcare system. Um, so, you know, when you, when you get that T-shape, right, when you go the deep EHR data and you combine that with the broad claims data, you now have a really unique view of the patient. The third element is the real-time transactional. This person, the admission discharge transfer type information, they just hit the ER. Claims data is delayed, right? But the admission discharge transfer data is real time. So for us, the every piece, every time we add in another one of these dimensions to the data, the value of it goes up exponentially in terms of being able to identify the right patient for the right intervention and to respond through actions and not just you know reports, but, but actual workflows. Um, so those are, I think those, that's some of the context for how we think of, of data and the need for interoperability, not just out of the EHR, but also out of the health systems and from the payers. How can all of this be done? And this is a question from the line that I think is excellent. How can this be done without adding a bigger burden to an already burnt out workforce of providers? Is there a way to get folks on all these value-based care systems without necessitating further clinical training? Yeah, I mean, we do it every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gotta make it simple, right? So we've, we've literally like trademarked the Allidate core four, which like boils down the change. You gotta, you gotta shrink the change. You gotta say, these are the, the, the four things you gotta do. And importantly, one word I wanna pick up that you said was the clinicians. Much of this is not the clinicians. Right. We have to engage the entire team, the entire practice team, from office managers to schedulers to, to nurses and care managers and the rest. I think the other piece is just to go by the guidance of do the right thing. You know, I mean, really, value-based care is doing the right thing. And, you know, we talked about that in the pandemic, that we did the right thing for our patients, for our employees. And it led to a, a financial implosion of the across the whole industry. So that, I think everybody thinks there's all of this to value-based training. It's very simple. It's the right thing for the right. It, it's do the right thing for the patient at the right time in the right setting. And it is not financially motivated because if you, think, in the end, the system is going to balance out for both the payer and the provider. Do you think there's any patient component as well as they demand greater transparency in some of their data or is that too far reaching of an implication for now? I think we're seeing patients really sit up and start paying attention to data. Um, I, you know, I think question before Stephanie about uh, monetizing uh, data and uh, we're having internal discussions really on ethics of um, ethics of data, ethical use of data. And while there's tremendous opportunities for us to learn from um, the data and do a lot of research and, and really mine the data, um, I, I think we're going to go into, uh, everybody was okay with Amazon knowing everything about them. Um, draw they the give it all to Amazon, and, give it all to Facebook. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, they don't they care about that. They do care about their medical data. And um, I, I think we're going to be, and the, uh, the more we um, dive into the data, 
hearing, I think we're going to see much more of the patient voice um, rise up. Tom, I do believe we are ahead of the patient. And I, I think, frankly, we're ahead of the, um, uh, of the government in many ways, right? In terms of patient privacy and some of the rights. Yeah, mm -hmm. There was some great work that was done with HIPAA years ago, and it, it's starting to show its age a bit. And we need to go mm -hmm. back. We need to revisit that. But I don't think there's any question that the consumer voice, the voice of the populace hasn't been fully heard here yet. And it will be heard as we continue this journey. Um, they, they want the convenience of having that data move, but they also want the comfort of knowing it's moving for their benefit, not for the benefit of a lot of other people in the system. It's interesting. Tom, that, oh, far aside, you continue. Yeah, when, when we were, um, we laid out our, our, you know, the grand, a decade ago, we said, well, let's, let's clarify what the grand strategy is for interoperability. Um, and we said there's three pieces to it. Uh, one is directed transactions. Group A has something to give to group B, and there's a business need for doing that. You want to move prescriptions. You want to move lab data. You want to move referrals. And we need to have clarity around what's the vocabulary, what's the terminology, what's the security model, what's the transport model, the, the kind of stuff that SureScripts really led the industry in doing that for prescriptions. We helped create that, those directed push transactions. And we created a, a agreed on a standard. And we just heard last week that there have been 2 billion transactions under the, the directed exchange model, many of them for referrals. So that's model one. Model two was health information exchanges, where you have- The old um, HIE. The old HIE. I remember used to talk right? about that. And we have trust frameworks. Really, these are just trust. This is the, the whole point of HIE is not the technology, it's the governance and the trust, where you have local groups who are going to be the, the, the trusted source of exchanging information. And during COVID, with uh, Duke Margolis Center, we did an investigation into how public health can gain access to clinical data from people who've been hospitalized with COVID. And it turns out it is now entirely feasible to do a nationwide query for like 95% of all hospitals in America for patient records with authentication and uh, authorization. So that, again, a decade later, it's actually working. But the third model we said was, we called it HIE of one, right? Like a patient should be able to go anywhere that they have their data and demand to get their data for free. And this concept has survived, you know, lawsuits and regulations and so forth. OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, just brought their 17th enforcement case, uh, basically saying a patient asked for their records and didn't give it to them fast enough or cheap enough. So I do think that the concept of the HIE, if one is, as Tom really put it well, we're ahead of the patient on this from the regulatory and policy side but I do see it as like the sword that cuts the Gordian knot of interoperability is if the patient asks for it, everyone's gonna give it to them. And we just need ways of collecting that information and putting it to use for the patient so they actually have a reason to go ask for it. And I, I love that expression that, that Farzad used, the, the, um, the trust fabric. In fact, that's exactly how we refer to it internally. And I'm sure Karen sees this at Geisinger as well. The amount of work, energy, resource that we put into security, privacy, compliance, these are just massive investments to make sure that the right people are getting this information and they're getting it for the right reason. And that is something the entire industry is adapting to as we open up the aperture and we give people access to this information. Um, and so there's always a risk here to be balanced, but the benefits are so great that we've got to keep moving forward. We just have to challenge ourselves to remember that this infrastructure has to grow and mature along with us. We've got a question from the line that I really like. Beyond data sharing, which we're talking about now, how do we ensure people actually trust the data? <laughs> it, it's a huge issue. Um, you know, I, I give ONC a tremendous amount of credit for pushing standards-based exchange. You know, what we've learned in our history is 
that, that's a wonderful statement. But when I can find on our network 120 different ways to say, take one pill by mouth daily, that's, that's a problem. And that's, that's just a small mm -hmm. example. Moving this information requires a lot of effort to normalize it. And the, the, the framework that Farzad laid out earlier, you know, where he's got the, the deep and the broad and the fast, he's bringing all that together. And I, I guarantee that they've got an engine behind there that is normalizing that based on the source that it originates at, based on you know what it was used for, because billing information is a little different than clinical information, and you've got to build those crosswalks. So I think the industry is doing a tremendous amount of work here, but listen, we're, we're not done. We've still got a ways to go. I would say we've made massive strides in this, though, in the last few years. Karen, we've got a question from you on the line as well. Um, Hospitals are highly regulated industries, and they often only fund these changes, these big sweeping changes, when it's mandated, as we've seen before, right, with the adoption of EHRs. How do we get the industry at scale to move forward on data sharing without always having some sort of, you know, regulatory stick in order to focus it? Yeah, I, I'm a big believer of policy and regulation and, and uh, regulatory levers. So I'm probably one um, that comes from the side of this. You are that stick. And I think regulation. <laughs> and I and I I think regulation is important, quite frankly, here um, for the reasons we talked about. I think standardization um, to make sure that we're going about interoperability in an appropriate way. Um, but I do think the interchange of value-based care and interoperability goes to, but we continue to add administrative burden to the total cost of care. We have to figure out the whole picture. And um, I think the, you're right, the, the person posing the question is absolutely right, that every time you add another regulation, you're adding a cost to the system and I and we're just never going to get a, around that unless at from in transformation in totality and then decide what we have to regulate but I think just adding piling up on administration you know we've done that the last 20 years it hasn't worked really well um, we've seen the total cost of care go up um, and much of the care and much of that total cost of care is administrative burden. So I believe regulate where it makes sense, um, but let's look at the totality of the industry of how we operate and um, make sure that our eyes on where we're really trying to go um, and that is improving the care that we're delivering and um, actually improving um, experience for our patients. I also think, Karen. I also think payment policies uh, yeah. we, when we think of regulations, we oftentimes too much think of, of like, you're going to get your wrist slapped or you're going to get some penalty or whatever. Um, but payment policy is, is policy. And if, mm -hmm. and the job of payment policy is to align private profits with public good. Mm -hmm. make, make it so that if I'm doing something to maximize my profits, I'm creating social good instead of you know, privatizing profits and, and, and nationalizing losses, right? So one of the things, as an example, that you could do is you could say, you know, and, and if we're going to pay for a, a hospitalization episode, that, you know, we're going to pay more if it includes good closing of the loop with the community physician, right? And we're going to pay less because it's worth less if you, if you don't do it, right? So that will then create a financial incentive for hospitals to really care about community interoperability, mm -hmm. as an example. Um, so I don't think it's it's an either or. Like either there's a business model for interoperability, or we use regulations and policy, right? I think that we could actually use regulations to create a framework where it's the business case is made for sharing data. Now, payment policy is so important, right? I mean, everyone talks about the pandemic and how telehealth took off because everyone was stuck at home. A good part of it is because doctors were finally getting compensated for it. Yeah. So they could use it as a tool. Do you think some of these citations that you've brought up before about information blocking could kind of accelerate that as well? Just because now there's 
there's an actual penalty if you don't give out the data in a more free manner? Yeah, we don't know what the penalties are yet, right? The CMS has to clarify the- Amorphous penalty. Yeah, I mean, it's it's gonna happen, right? We need to, but we do need that clarification on what the, what the um, exactly how the penalties are gonna work. The other big, big, big one is the conditions of participation in Medicare. Mm -hmm. So there's a set of safety and health survey and cert requirements for hospitals um, to participate in, in Medicare and along with basically all of the seven of us, the, all the former US National Coordinators for Health IT wrote a letter to CMS saying, we think it's appropriate for you to use those conditions of participation rules as a way to further interoperability and data sharing on, on discharge. And CMS um, promulgated those, but we still have yet to see the details on the hospital surveys of what that would mean. Which do you think comes first, the policy changes or the shift to value-based care? Just given there is actual safety and demand for it now that we didn't see before. I think Tom said it well. I think these are, we've, we're taking lurching right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot steps. It's not always a beautiful gliding coordination, but, but I think both of those are, have been lurching forward uh, in tandem. Tom, I'd actually love to ask you, since you have a, a view as a tech platform, do you think the systems need a tech overhaul in order to get this data new or interoperable? Or is it is it something where we could keep the existing systems and introduce some sort of tech innovators or blockchain or anything like that to bridge the gaps? Yeah, I, I think there's a massive amount of innovation going on right now. Um, and I don't think this is the time to do a massive rip and replace on what's going on in the industry. I think if you look at what Karen's organization has done, what Farzad's organization has done, that, that gives you an example of how they're innovating on top of an infrastructure there. And it may not be the infrastructure we would all build if we were starting today. You know what? It's bedrock. It's there. It's getting utilized. It's providing um, the information feeds and the digitization platform that we need. Now the question is, how do we enhance that interoperability, build in more intelligence, make sure that at the point of care, we're really giving the clinicians the information they need and shielding them from information that others in their organization need and doing it in a way that, you know, we just continue to evolve. So I, I again, I, I don't think the platforms are where we would, uh, the way we would build them if we started today, but I think we've got a very good foundation here to build upon. So if we have that strong foundation, this is gonna tie into one of the questions that we have from the line, what is the, the biggest impediment? Is it technical? Is it financial? Is it regulatory? Is it something else that we're not even thinking about right now? Changing habits? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think Workflow inertia changes. plays a huge role here, right? Inertia plays a big role. We, we've got organizations that have grown up certain ways. We've got clinicians that have grown up certain ways. We've got technologists that have grown up certain ways. And everyone's being asked to change the way they think, the way they react, the tools that they build, the skills that they exercise. I, I just think it's a, a massive exercise in change management. And, and that takes time to do it in a way that is sustainable and we have to remember, we can't break what we have as we do this. We have an obligation to the populace to move it further and make it better without regressing and taking steps backwards that are meaningful and hurt patient health. So th there's a lot there that goes into this. Aaron, I, I would love piece. to hear your perspective. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you probably have a better so, than any on inertia and doctors. Well, I, I think the other piece is we, Stop just evangelizing the, the greatness of interoperability, value-based care. We tend to come up with very large initiatives. You have the believers who are going out and saying value is better, interoperability is better, and we keep it at a very high level. We really need to get it down to the clinician to say, this is what the value to you is. If we push to get all of the information you need. This will be the, your value. You will be able to learn from the data we provide how to take better care of your patients. 
And I think on a policy front and, you know, some of the other innovations that we've tried over the last, um, over the last 10 years, I would say continue to do today, we missed that piece. So we have the believers and we segment the industry like that, but we don't get down to the level of where the value is really created. And I think if we're going to be successful with maximizing interoperability of data, um, we need to really, we, we really need to start can, uh, to articulate well what the use cases are, where they're successful, and uh, come out with some wins so that we get this widely uh, adopted. Did you see any hesitance from from their doctor population about partnering with payers in order to get to this? Uh, I, ha I really haven't seen the hesitancy on the part of physicians. I have seen hesitancy on the part of payers. Um, I think payers tend to um, believe that the cost data is much more complicated. Um, not all, but some. Um, you know, I think that uh, providers understand that they need all of the data, if, if particularly in value-based arrangements. They need to have the data. Um, I think there's a, I, I think there is, if I had a pick, I'd say there's much more hesitancy on the side of a um, payer than the provider. Now, I don't know, maybe Tom and Farzad would challenge me on that, but um, that has been my experience. I think it's interesting thinking about um, uh, platforms. You mentioned SureScripts being a platform that sits between thousands and thousands of pharmacies and thousands and thousands of, of providers. I think we also need intermediaries in a way to sit between providers and payers. And to, except when you're a large integrated delivery network like Geisinger, which is both a payer and a right. Right, those, those are great uh, institutions, but much of the US healthcare system is so fragmented. You have so many different insurance mm -hmm. products, so many different uh, employers, so many different purchasers, so many different payers, and so many different uh, providers. And what we really, I mean, this, what, we, what, what we do at Allidate is basically work to get these groups that have been adversaries, right? They've been, it's been a zero sum game. Right. If I want to, if I get paid more, that means that the insurer's costs went up. Right. If I get paid less, then right. So it's been this this battle, literally, and it's caused, I think, a lot of mistrust. Mm -hmm. There isn't a ton of trust between payers and providers on either direction right now. But value based care says now we're on the same side of the table. Now, if you win, I win. But saying that and actually getting there are two different things because it's the same people. But the, and those companies who are, who are who are negotiating their fee schedule contracts are now trying to negotiate value-based contracts, and those instincts die hard. And data sharing makes you vulnerable. The second you start sharing your data, you start share your claims data, share your HR data. Now you're vulnerable to your former enemy knowing a lot about you, right? So uh, I think it's this is where um, intermediaries can come in as a platform to sit between the two and almost create a trust context where information can be shared with, you know, like almost like a Switzerland and we can actually align the financial incentives and, and step forward on a new, new path. One of the nicest things that one of our docs said was for the first time, I feel like the health plan's a partner with me. And that's not something you normally hear doctors say. Do you think with, with that idea in mind that there's going to be just a bunch of these different intermediaries, like uh, the HIE version 2.0s of the world? Or do you think it's something that has to be done by the government? Well, I, I, was, I was talking about it from the value-based care side, uh, where I think that there's, there's tremendous uh, business cases uh, to be made for uh, physician enablement uh, companies that help bridge the gap on both the data and on the contract and on the workflow side for uh, independent practices who want to engage in value-based care. We've got a question from the line that I think is pretty interesting. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, for service to be versus fee for value and how there's some sort of savings opportunity. On a more granular basis, what are those cost savings opportunities, right? Where are you seeing the biggest pockets of, of spend? 
Karen, do you want to take that? Sure. So um, definitely, I think um, that on the hospital side, um, that's where the, that's where the high dollars are. Um, but I think the, it's it's a simple answer. Um, I think the savings. So, for example, I'm passionate about rural health. You know, the dollar is going into rural communities for rural health. It's not about savings. It's about developing a sustainable, high-quality delivery system, whether that be a virtual system, whether that be it's health care for community, rural communities. It's not about savings. It, it isn't, you're not going to create something that is going to have huge savings, but you're going to trans, you have the ability to transform rural America and healthcare in rural America by taking the dollars and spending them in a more sensible way. I think there is definitely, as we talk about value-based care in a fee-for-service world, the more I do, the bigger I do it, the more money I make. And um, I think that in looking at, we have to bring the cost of healthcare down. And you can do it in one of two ways. You can slash fee schedules, take the unit cost down, or you can figure out thoughtfully how to do it in a value-based way. I would rather the, la the, la uh, the latter part um, as opposed to, I think we've all lived through the slashing of the unit cost and yeah. you just have to do more units. So um, I think that's, uh, that from my perspective, um, you know, big cost is usually hospital cost because that's where you get paid. Yeah, it's interesting. If you look at the data on where different organizations have created savings, hospital ACOs, have mostly created mm -hmm. savings on post-acute care. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Makes sense. Everyone wants to take money out, not of, out of themselves, they want to take it out of from whoever's downstream from them, right? So hospitals who, who took on risk focused on reducing post-acute costs, and there's tons of post-acute costs to be shrunk, but physician-led groups who take risk tend to get their savings from what's downstream of them, which is the hospital. <laughs> so what we what we find is is the the and hospitalizations are the, the most expensive thing, and and you know generally no one wants to be uh, hospitalized unnecessarily. So we're finding easily fifteen percent reductions in all cause hospitalizations, uh, and that Karen that goes rural and urban uh, mm -hmm. populations mm -hmm. uh, through better primary care. Uh, double digit also emergency room utilization and then uh, post acute days away from home and skilled nursing. Those are the three biggest pockets so far that we've been able to access through primary care. I do think specialist costs are another huge category, um, but I don't know that we've yet figured out the right policy framework. We thought bundles were it. The data evidence doesn't seem to show great uh, results from the bundles programs, at least to date, uh, some of the mandatory bundles may do better. Karen, you brought up kind of the difference between rural and urban value-based care. I'd actually love to explore that topic a little bit more because in the rural communities, often they are both the primary care provider and the hospital in one. So how, how can you take some of the learnings that Farzad's had so far in Allidade and bring mm -hmm. that into the rural side of the world? So I, I think by creating a mechanism for payment that allows the transformation of rural communities, rural health care delivery system. So hospitals have to try to be every, they're, first of all, they're the economic engine of the community. They're the yeah. largest, most of the time, the largest employer. Um, unfortunately, rural communities have um, much lower um, outcomes when compared to their urban counterparts, which means they, they really, they're at much more risk of chronic diseases. So we need to figure out um, a way to actually reimburse the population for the population health and not just for hospital care. And, you know, a combination of working with primary care the services that you're truly able to deliver, not services that you're doing because you're doing one hip a month, um, just because you have to get that um, you have to get that fee for service payment in. But um, you know, there's a, a right now CMS has a 
payment uh, test underway with the state of Pennsylvania called the Pennsylvania Rural Health Initiative, which is a global payment for um, rural hospitals that allows them to transform into a much more community focused, uh, much more community focused in population health than trying to get heads in the bed. That makes sense. Now we have about 10 minutes left. I've got a question from the line that has been upvoted so much. I feel bad that I have ignored it for this long, but I think it might be a little hard to answer. What is the market share for value-based care in primary care versus other healthcare segments? And how does that differ by different geographic regions? Does anyone have an answer to that? I'm betting on Farzad. Yeah, I'm betting the, on healthcare, part of the Healthcare Payment and Learning Action Network is collecting some of this information in terms of the percent of care that's in, in value-based. Uh, one of the estimates is that about a third of um, beneficiaries, Medicare beneficiaries, uh, have their uh, primary care provider taking a risk uh, on their cost through the traditional Medicare program. And that's probably pretty representative now. Now, most of that is, is um, one-sided risk uh, still. It's not you know, significant downside on the, on the shared side, which I think really does drive deeper adherence to value-based principles. Um, so I, I think that's a pretty fair estimate right now, but it depends a lot on the market segment. So we looked at California as an example, and in California, 92% of smaller practices with fewer than 292 were not in oh a shared savings model with medicare 92 percent of the smallest practices were not even though california is thought of as like the home of you know capitation and risk taking mm -hmm. so it depends a lot on the market segment uh, over 50 percent of the large multi-specialty clinics were in those arrangements I always think of California as like the, the earliest adopter. I thought you were about to say 90% of them were already in right? there. A big surprise for me. All right, I have one last question for all three of you. I'd love all of your different takes and then I'll let us get to this magician act, which will be uh, way more fun than what I'm asking. <laughs> but how do we make sure the lessons that we've learned from this pandemic around accelerating innovation and shifting people closer to you know, data interoperability and value-based care continues after the pandemic is over and we don't kind of fall back into what was comfortable before. Tom, you wanna kick it off? Sure, I'll take a crack at it. Um, you know, it, it, I would say in the world of COVID right now, it, it's kind of difficult to not live day to day. Um, we, so we, we've got to remember to step back and look at the bigger picture and develop a real appreciation for the tools that we've built as an industry that can help the care teams get that panoramic view of the patient's history, whether it be clinical or uh, the, the medications, et cetera. I, I think that we've started down a great path there. We need to remember also, I, I'll go back to something that, that Farzad said earlier, that you know, we, we're in the middle of this crisis or hopefully towards the end of it, maybe if we get lucky here and we keep executing well. But if you look at it, we it's been in a, a kind of a, a lab for innovation and it's accelerated innovation. And to the point that was made um, earlier, I don't know that it's necessarily a bunch of new things that got started, but things that were in flight moved a lot more quickly than we would have expected them to. And I think that remembering that urgency, remembering how quickly we were all able to adapt is going to be key because we still face some huge challenges here, right? I mean, I can tell you, I'm gonna leave this session today and I'm immediately going to get on a series of calls about how do we get the documentation about people having been vaccinated to the point of care, right? How, how do we do that quickly? Because the information's flowing in one direction, but it's not flowing in another. And, and we need that. Give us those cards. Yeah, exactly. What nonsense is that? <laughs> yeah. That's it. Yeah. I, maybe we can fax it to everybody and just handle it that way, which seems to be a good solution in healthcare. But, you know, I, I think we've got a real opportunity here and we need to continue to make progress the way that we have for the last, you know, year, year and a half as we face these. And I, I think the last piece that I would call out is there's been some fabulous public-private collaboration during this time. 
we need to see that continue. That, that's an important aspect of this. You know, the, the single largest population is the entire US, right? And we've shown that we can get information into the federal government, into the CDC, into the FDA, pretty effectively um, with some quick changes. We need to make sure that collaboration continues moving forward if we want to see the innovation stick. Karen, what's your take? Reflection and discipline. So I hope after this, both as I, I think not only as the industry, but as individuals, that we're gonna reflect back on the last year and really make it count for all the pain and suffering that we've seen. I think we have to reflect on what worked, where were the gaps, you know, and how are we gonna do it better? And then have the discipline to really do it because it's very easy to slide back it's much easier to slide back than to push forward. And I think we have to have that reflection with very clear lessons and then the discipline to execute. Agreed on that. Farzad, wanna close it out? Um, I think COVID uh, is gonna be seen as a, as a watershed uh, for, for many things. And I, I do think that one of the lasting lessons of it will be that we can move fast. We have the ability. It's, it's like someone who's been sitting in a chair forever and then they get up and they sprint <laughs> for the door and we sprinted for the door and we did so many, um, we responded so well in, in many ways, very poorly in other ways to be clear. Uh, but I, I hope what we hold on to is that what it feels like to move fast on behalf of the patient. I spent so much time talking about digital health and saying, you know, it's just slow moving because all the other entities are so slow moving. And last year, wow, that really changed everything. So I, I hope we continue there. I thank you everyone for spending the past hour with us. This has been a wonderful conversation. And Tom, Karen, Farzad, I really appreciate it. Hopefully everyone can stay on for uh, some, some Dan Chan magician work. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you to Stephanie and to all of our panelists. If you would like to continue the conversation, please join us on Twitter. And now we would like to welcome to the virtual stage, Dan Chan. Hello. How's everyone doing today? If you make me co-host or host and my tech crew co-host, we can get started. And we'll start the video. My name is Dan Chan. And my name is James Chan. Together we perform magic, juggling, and more as a father and son duel. Hello. Again, my name is Dan Chan. I wanted to thank you all for joining. All of you are true stars. What makes you a true star is who you are on the inside. What you do day in and day out molds you into, into a true superstar. If we can get one or two people to help out, if you would like to help out with our next effect, please share your video. So we'll get one or two people. And if you could rename yourself as well. Well, Farzad, how are you doing? It's Jody. I don't know why it says that. Hi, Jody. Uh, is Very that with a Y or with an I? With a Y. Okay. Feel free to rename yourself, uh, Jody. Now, 
In a moment, I'm gonna hypnotize the two of you or anyone else who wants to participate. So in order to, for me to hypnotize you, I'm gonna ask that you would repeat after me. So unmute yourselves and repeat after me. 10, 14, 16. 10, 10 14, 16. 18, 22, 24. 18, 18 22, 24. Okay, let's try that one more time. 18, 22, 24. 18, 22, 24. Both of you name a vegetable now. Carrot. Carrot. What? What did you both say? Carrot. Carrot. Interesting that you both said carrot pretty much at the same time. I said I was going to hypnotize you. Did I deliver? Because I am wearing a carrot colored tie. Ah, uh, makes sense. Also, all the numbers you said were associated with carrot weight in gold. 10 carat, 14, 16, 18, 22, 24 carat gold. Eddie, do you feel a little bit manipulated? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and we've we haven't set anything up, correct? No. No. Um, let's go a little bit further. Eddie, I'm going to have you help me. In a moment, I'm going to ask that you think of a two-digit number. Okay. Between 1 and 50. With both digits being odd and both digits being different, Eddie. What number are you sensing? 35. 35. You could have said any number and you said 35. Mm -hmm. Very interesting that you said 35. The number 35. Thank you, Eddie. Yep. Now, Eddie, do you happen to have Instagram with you? Uh, not on me right now, no. What about uh, you, Jody? I do. Can I have you go to Kid Magician on Instagram? Yes, hold on. Just one more. Yeah, Kid Magician on Instagram, please. Okay. On the top, you should see a link that says 11Z. Yes. Click on that. Click on that link, please. Okay. And um, can you show us what you see? Perfect. I would like you to think of any playing card at all, but please do not think of the Ace of Spades nor think of the Queen of Hearts because for some reason, women tend to think of the Queen of Hearts, which makes it very, very easy. Uh, what card are you thinking of? Okay. I can say it? Yes, please. The Jack of Hearts. Jack of Hearts. Did you notice that we have this card right here, even yes. before you stated your card? Not really, but now I'm noticing it. Interesting. You said the Jack of Hearts because right here I have a card. And if you look very close, you can see that there is a J right here. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right below that, there is a heart. Heart. No so that, way. of course, means that you got it right. Oh, my gosh. I changed the... my mind in my head like five times before I said that, too. So it's very weird. I know. <laughs> Actually, zoom in on that photo to my son's button. His button. Okay. There is a oh, button yep. right there. Yep. And let's spotlight uh, Jody. Bring that up close. Right there on the button is a J and a heart on that Instagram. And if you go to Instagram and check out Kid Magician, you should see that as well. Excellent. Um, Eddie, back to you. Yep. What is your favorite fast food restaurant? Shake Shack. Shake Shack. Uh, can you do me a favor and uh, pull up Shake Shack's number for us? Okay. You can screen share if you'd like, or you can do it on your phone. Either one is fine. I'll do it on my phone. And anyone? Yes. Any Shake Shack, just go ahead and Google or Yelp their number, please. Yep. Yeah, I have it. Um, okay. Can you go ahead and uh, share that number with me, please? So 646. Okay. 668. 668. 
four eight eight zero. Okay, uh, is that? Oh, let me lower the screen brightness. And before we call Shake Shack, what would you like to order? Um, probably just a standard uh, sh Shake Shack burger. I don't know. Normal. Just a Shake Shack burger. Yeah, Shack burger. Just a Shack yeah. burger. <laughs> and um, that is the number right here, correct? Yes. And what Shake Shack is it? Uh, it's the one on Third Ave. Third in what city? New York. New York. Oh, you're in New York. Excellent. Yep. So um, before we do that, um, name any playing card. Uh, Ten of Hearts. Ten of Hearts. Ten of Hearts. Excellent. You see that right there? Yep. I'm going to hit send. And we are calling. We'll put it on speakerphone. You can see that. Uh, yeah, this is Dan Chan. I'm here with my friend Eddie, and he would love a Shack Burger. All right, one Shack Burger. Anything else, sir? Uh, I think I'll have one as well. But um, we we have this bet going. I wanted to. Um, we're, we're betting that you could guess a card for us. You think you could guess a card for us, please? Excuse me, a card? Yeah, like uh, in a deck of playing cards. Exactly. Just any card. Yeah, any card, just name the card. Um, ten of hearts. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. I'm going to have my personal assistant call back with a credit card later. Thank you again. Eddie, that <laughs> was amazing. That's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I've got to order Shake Shack now since yeah. they're a good sport. <laughs> they, um, I guess they're our sponsor for today. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, let's go back to um, jo Jody. Jody, mm -hmm. uh, it, we're going to need a little bit of personal information from you. Okay. So we'll start off with. Um, your birthday. So go ahead and give us your birthday. Just the month and day. Month date first. Uh, 613. Six plus 13. And you guys can all follow along. And then you hit equal, you get 19. And then the year, but you can make it up, Jody. If no, you it's fine. Uh, 1987. 1987. You hit equal. Plus your billing zip code, please. Uh, 10003. Okay, that's New York as well, yes? Yes. And then we hit equal, and we should get 12009. And then I will need the last four digits of your social security number, your mother's <laughs> maiden name, and your ATM <laughs> passcode. Go ahead, Jody, please. Good, good one. Um, should I just make up? Social no, you can give me the real one. I'm not going to give you the real one, Dan. <laughs> Uh, okay, that, that's okay. We're just gonna, I'm gonna plug in three, three or four random digits. We'll do this. Okay. And we get one, uh, nine, three, zero, and then you hit equal and you should get one, two, nine, three, nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that number mean anything to you? Uh, no. Maybe your monthly salary. <laughs> I wish, yeah. No, that's, that's nothing. One that's thing. nothing compared to your monthly salary isn't that oh, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um jody let's uh, come back to that in just a second i'm going to leave this right here uh, jody please go ahead and give us a random to uh, a random number between one and 100 please just a random number between one and 100 13 13. You could have said any number, yet you said 13. Inside my notes application, I have a list of beverages. Every single beverage is different from 1 to 13. Or what number do you see on 13? Pepsi. Pepsi. I would love to share <laughs> a bottle of Pepsi with you today. <laughs> wow. That's good. Are you sure that number doesn't mean anything to you? What was it again? 
Maybe well, this will help you. Okay. <gasps> Pepsi oh. mirror backwards is one, wow. two, nine, three, nine. With all the numbers that you gave us, we came to Pepsi. Jeez. That's weird. <laughs> I think we have time for one more. We're going to play a game, and this is called the three shell game. I'm going to pull this up. The three shell game. The name of the game is to follow the P. Five will get you 10, and 10 will get you 20. Follow that P. It's in one, two, or three. It's either in one, two, or three. That's one. That's three. And that is two. What? We'll do it again. Again, keep your eyes on that P. One, two, or three. That's two. Wow. Okay, last try. Keep, I'll even tell you how the trick works, guys. It's that way you don't lose your money out in New York on the streets of New York, because they do play that in New York, I've been told. In between the spaces, you'll see the piece sneak out. Watch closely. Mm -hmm. Did you see it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, one, two, or three. You know, three. That is so, why they call this a confidence game because they try to build up your confidence so uh, that they can take your money. Wow, we never got it right. <laughs> Thank you once again. My name is Dan Chen. You guys were a wonderful audience. Thank, uh, thank you for coming and have a nice day. <laughs>